Our theme for April has been awakening, an appropriate theme, I think, for the springtime of the year. I remember in the congregation of my childhood um, singing that last song every year, Lo, the Earth Awakes Again. The words were written by Samuel Longfellow, brother of the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Samuel was a Unitarian minister serving in a number of New England congregations and briefly in Brooklyn, New York. How our spirits soar and sing, how our hearts leap with the spring and all those alleluias. It was, of course, an Easter hymn. And the tune is actually even called that, although some people are familiar with it as a Christmas song. I later found out it was rewritten from these original words. Lo, the earth again is risen, living from its wintry prison. Bring we flower and leaf and spray to adorn our holiday. Over again, the word comes true. Lord, he maketh all things new. Now the dark cold days are o'er low and glad light and gladness are before now our hearts leap with the spring how our spirits soar and sing light is victor over gloom life trans triumphant o'er the tomb well an easter hymn indeed unitarians of course have had a complicated relationship with easter since the original basis of unitarianism was that god was one not three and gradually more Unitarians came to believe that Jesus was a human role model and teacher, not in any sense God. And then with the 20th century, many Unitarians became humanists and many humanists became Unitarians, moving outside of Christianity and outside of traditional theism. So as a child and young adult, I heard this as a song about spring. Alleluia, spring is here, winter is over. Even if some friends elsewhere in our state and country had a bit of a late wintry snow this last week, daffodils have bloomed and now it's the turn of the tulips. Bright flowers reminding us that the seasons are turning and the plants are one by one returning to their glory. For me, this has always been what my humanism is about our focus on our life here, our acknowledgement of our inner connections with the natural world, our commitment to making this life and this world a more beautiful and more welcoming home for all who live here. My dictionary tells me that the word awakening can mean the act or moment of waking from sleep, the act or moment of become suddenly aware of something or coming into existence or coming into awareness. The earth awakes again from winter slumber. We awaken in spring to the beauty around us, or maybe into more understanding and awareness of something we were unaware of until now. My dictionary online, and so very up to date, also defines the past tense of wake or awakened as woke. And it includes this meaning for woke, alert to injustice and discrimination in society, especially racism. It is a much mocked word, woke, these days. We even have a state removing from use in the public schools a math textbook because it uses as an example of the use of statistics, some statistics about unconscious racial prejudice. Don't be woke. Well, I guess the opposite then is please stay asleep and unaware. We cannot have children, of course, aware that there is racial prejudice. It might make some of them uncomfortable. A new Florida law signed into uh, law just two days ago limits the ability of employers to include in any trainings, any discussions of unconscious racial bias. This joins a similar law forbidding discussion in any classroom of sub such subjects. The law is targeted at um, the comfort of those 
who might, and I quote from the law, feel guilt, anguish, or other forms of psychological awareness because of past oppressions. Saying, we're not going to tell uh, other kids that they are oppressed based on their race either. Might make them uncomfortable to hear about their oppression. Universities can lose their funding if any professor teaches that racial discrimination exists today. There is, of course, already a lawsuit filed against these laws on the basis of freedom of speech. Beyond that, the law about schools and what they can teach even forbids teaching children about empathy. Since this is the only reason that some of the textbooks already identified as banned were found to be in violation of the law. Teaching children to be aware of the feelings of others or teaching that something happened in history or exists in the present that might result in feelings about past or present discrimination. I would say that's actually really about awakening. Mock it as woke, but I'd say it's better to be woke than asleep and unaware of history and reality and other people. When I chose this topic for today, I had no idea that it would be quite so appropriate for this week. Um, but the tying of a reform of society to the concept of awakening, that is nothing new. And while controversial today, I contend that it is actually a critical part of who and what we are as an ethical society. To create and sustain a more humane world where every individual's worth and dignity is respected, where our interconnection with the rest of the natural world is centered, where our relationships with each other are centered, relationships with other people, with the entire natural universe, to do that requires that we are aware of awaken to aspects of those relationships which may not right now be in accord with our basic goals of inclusion and interconnection. How do we change if we are not aware? In the classic writing Walden, Henry David Thoreau uses his time living in the woods to get in touch with what he believes to be the best in himself, the most real within him. And thus he's trying to model what he thinks others can do, whether they go off to the woods or not. In one chapter, he muses on awakening. He gets up every morning and walks in the woods, not to get his steps in on his Apple watch, but to get in touch with himself by getting connected with nature. And he muses that awakening is not just about the physical act, of waking up from physical sleep. This is a quote from Walden. It matters not what the clocks say or the attitudes and labors of people. Morning is when I am awake and there is a dawn in me. Morning, dawn, and awakening are metaphors as well as descriptions of physical realities. And he continues, Moral reform is the effort to throw off sleep. Now think about that. Ethics is the effort to throw off sleep. The same man who wrote about civil disobedience to refuse to comply with unjust laws that promoted imperialism and enslavement. He also considered the ethics of John Brown in one of his early articles whether or when it might be appropriate or not to defend the liberty and freedom and dignity of others with something beyond civil disobedience. And such actions he, he knew require that we are aware and awake, awake to the injustices and oppressions that exist. Moral reform, ethical action is the effort to throw off sleep. Because working for more justice, freedom, equality, dignity, for the basics of meaningful living requires that we first look within. 
Thoreau goes on, we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn, which does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. In order to awaken and keep ourselves awake or woke, it's also important that we have a vision, an infinite expectation of the dawn, of what life and the world could be. We don't have to be optimistic that the vision will come into being without our help. We do have to be conscious that it is possible. If we stay awake and do our part, that this life and this world in our vision might be possible. And of course, this awakening and keeping ourselves awake doesn't just apply to one set of issues in the world. Thoreau is suggesting that a crucial part of becoming our own best selves is first to be awake and to have a vision of what life in the world could be like, to, as he goes on to say, paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which he says we can do in the moral or ethical sense, in the sense of becoming our best self. Thoreau took to the woods um, and he took with him one of the first English translations of the Indian religious text, the Bhagavad Gita. Why? To challenge himself, to go beyond the texts that he had grown up with, had learned in university, beyond the writings of the great Romans and Hebrews and Christians and European philosophers with which he was very familiar to awaken himself, to become aware of that to which he and Western civilization had been asleep to and unaware of. I believe that ethical culture inherited a whole lot of the social and personal vision of the transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Theodore Parker. The transcendentalists saw this intentional awakening at the center of life as self-culture, cultivating one's own best self. Felix Adler in The Next Generation brought in the idea of ethical culture, that we do this not just by culturing or cultivating ourselves, not just by walking through the woods alone, but also in relationship and in community, inspiring each other, challenging each other, educating each other. We sometimes describe the ethical culture movement that inspires the creation of ethical communities like our own as educational and religious. To paraphrase Adler, it's religious for the religious minded and educational for the education minded. It's religious in the sense of seeing our values of human worth and human connection as the highest values not just a few of our values, but the values that at the core guide our living, to live deliberately, as Thoreau said. And it's educational in the sense of understanding that we will always be learning, and our very interactions with each other can be educational if we are open to listening, taking in the experience of each other, being each other's teachers to grow deliberately and intentionally beyond where we have been. I would contend that the vision of ethical culture centered on the worth and interrelatedness of every human being requires us to educate ourselves on those aspects of human history where human beings have violated worth and taken advantage in relationships. This means being aware of the human desire for equality the vision of being seen, being heard, being valued. And it also requires us to accept the existence of sicknesses like racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, abuse of our environment, all of those things that value and see and hear ourselves over others. To be aware of a vision of freedom and harmony, 
that accepts and honors our beautiful differences, and that there is also a human and social tendency to master, possess, and control other people, land, and the natural world. A tendency to make some people more powerful than others, and some to have more value than others. Yes, we can sometimes, on awakening in the moral sense, go through a phase of embarrassment, even shame, even other bad feelings, because we have not been seeing parts of reality that violate our very sense of what is good and true. It is a natural human reaction, though, one that if we are able to acknowledge it and accept it, we can work through. It is a temporary phase where we understand that how life and history has been or how life is now is not what our vision says is the way we want life and relationship in the future to be. What if we could see that hierarchies of domination or networks of co-equal, co-powerful individuals and forces of nature are two very different ways of looking at the world. And then that how we look at the world shapes how the world becomes. What if we do paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look? If we believe that hierarchies of power and value are the natural way, we're going to create a world in which such hierarchies of power and value get stronger. Conflicts and wars will be common as every community strives to be at the top of the hierarchies in order to be valued. In this view of reality, individuals are in the way and thus can be sacrificed. In small ways, they can be sacrificed by simply giving some advantage of some groups over others and disadvantaging other groups. In larger ways, it can be done by making some groups abnormal by making some groups less human and thus more easily sacrificed. In more major ways, by creating empires and by correlation colonies to be treated as lesser. Even by genocide. A continuum of how people are treated in a system of domination to maintain mastery, possession, and control. Where everyone is trying to create certainty and therefore creates struggle and chaos. Because if being on top of the hierarchy is the main value, there will always be revolutions to try to overturn which group, which individuals are on top. And any attempt to change will be seen as striving for another group to gain that, that same kind of mastery, possession, and control. I think here of the increasingly publicly voiced fear that is called white replacement theory. The assumption that if other groups than those called white get an equal say in society, then those other groups will treat white people as those other groups have been treated. It is a fear that whites are replaced, not just in becoming a numerical minority, but in giving up their advantages and their superior place. The other vision, the opposite vision for society can also be self-sustaining. A society where we all are acknowledged as having worth, where difference is a strength and not a threat, where we are co-equal in power and in relationship with each other. That society is one where we all continue to learn from the experiences of others. We can all continue to grow and change where we understand that the common good means that which is good for each and all, and where we accept uncertainty not as dangerous, but as an opportunity. But it is hard when we've been told our whole lives that the goal is to become masters, possessors, and controllers. It means if we want something different, we have to be awake to both the vision of a different way of being and to the reality that that hierarchical dominator model does not produce what it claims to produce, 
except temporarily. It's not a surprise then that when more people are beginning to be awake and realize that the world is not what we have been taught, that there is a desperate response. Every action in nature to change inertia, certainty, and the way things were will produce an attempt to have an equal and or greater opposite reaction. More and more people are waking up to the ways that racism has been a constant in our history. So an answer is to pass laws trying to keep the next generation from hearing about it. Or on a more intimate level, when the power relationship between two people is beginning to change, the person with more power will attempt to exercise that power in a way that prevents change. That is, unless they are awake to the disadvantages that such a hierarchical relationship brings to everyone in it. I admire those in our world who are white, cisgender, straight males who have awakened to the fact that their lives will be enriched by interconnections and diversity and equality rather than threatened by those. And those of us who've been at the top of any of those hierarchies of power and value can wake up to this too. It's to the advantage of the dominator hierarchical structure that those higher up in the power and possession pyramid and those who are in the lower in the pyramid are asleep to the disadvantages that they have or asleep to the possibility that there could be change. I've had a few people over the years try out an ethical society and leave pretty quickly because what they expected was a place that taught a strict code of right and wrong and how everyone should behave in order to fit into the world as it is now. And that vision, I hope, is never what we are about. And yet, we all sometimes express in our actions and words that dominator hierarchical model in which we were immersed. It is the water in which we swim and the air we breathe. It is my firm belief, not only that we need to become awake, that we too are imperfect, but that we have to have each other's wisdom and each other's experiences to help us wake up to that different vision and find the steps that will take to make changes in our own lives in order to make the change in the world that we want to see. We need to be awake and to help others be awake. We need to stay awake, stay woke to the existence of injustice or injustice will prevail. We need to decenter what we have seen as normal or usual in the past and center the vision of a different reality. For me, that is a key meaning of what it means to be awakened, to have an infinite expectation of the dawn, to know that if and only if we are awake, we will see that dawn, and then to walk together into the new day knowing that awakening is not a one-time act, but a constant intentional act that we will sometimes slip into sleep and then with intention wake up. Well, it is an imperfect metaphor as any metaphor is. In real life, sleep heals and rebuilds, but in our ethical lives to sleep may mean that the fires burning around us will gain strength and be harder to control. To be awake, to be aware of the history, the vision, the potential, the need for our commitment and action. For me, that's a key, even if imperfect metaphor for the ethical life. Well, we're now gonna say goodbye to those who have been listening on video and invite them to join us some Sunday for a more participative experience.